feel like my voice is going to sound a little weird today. Why? I spent all week training new people in a loud, noisy warehouse, and even uh, though they gave me a microphone and a little like speaker box to hang around my neck to yeah. use, I still have to talk really, really loud. And I had to do that for like two, three days in a row. Yeah. See, I'm just in like a weird headspace because like I'm very anxious about Monday for many reasons, and I'm just and like... it has nothing to do with the squid that's on your head. No, and I have talk a squid about a weird headspace. Head. Yeah. That, that having it's a squid a piece on of your toast. head puts you in a weird headspace, I will confirm. And we're not going to give any context on that. We're just going to let listeners picture the squid on your head holding a piece of toast. Yes, that's all they need to know. That's it. The end. And welcome to Into the Fold, a show where two best friends share their love of Lee Bardugo's Grishaverse chapter by chapter. I'm Jeff. And I'm Juliana. And this week we're talking about Shadow and Bow in chapters 15 and 16. Welcome, listeners. Hi. Hello. We're happy to My be back. My voice is going to sound like this the whole time. Wow. wow. I never know what like... I sound like until the episodes actually come out. You'd think I would be used to it by now. This yeah. is our 10th episode. Yeah. Have we done 10 episodes already? Yeah. We're getting old. Wow. We're yeah, old, we yeah. are old. We are like 100 years old. Yeah. Combined. Uh, approximately. Give or take. Easily. Give or take a few years there. I mean, the Darkling is 150 years old, so we still have some time to make up before we're actually like old. Where did old. you get 150? That's not even part of the lie. Is it 120? I'm pretty sure it's 125, but oh. that, never mind. We'll get there. We'll get there. It's in it's in the thing. The squid is stealing my brain, Jeff. Well, yeah. It's stealing I mean, it. If I was a squid on somebody's head, I would definitely be stealing stuff. That makes sense. That's airtight logic. <laughs> you think that it's eating toast? No. No, 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 no. It's eating nah, my brain. The squid is up to something. Yes, it's notor it's nefarious, not notorious, nefarious. <laughs> okay. So hopefully the listeners are good and ready, because since we're talking about chapters 15 and 16 of Shadow and Bone today, hopefully they've read up to that point, because if they haven't, then we will have spoilers for that point in the book. But if they have read it, then they're ready. Okay, we'll be summing up the chapters in case they haven't. Yes. Good. Great. Now let's get to the news from the front. news okay so first off just happy halloween everyone this episode is going to be coming out like a little bit before halloween so happy halloween to everyone uh, if you have some grishaverse inspired costumes that you're wearing please share them with us we would love to see if you're dressing up as milo or as the apparat or any of the characters that we have in the book or in the show. So we would love to see any costumes that you have. So share them with us, please. And if you live in a place where they don't celebrate Halloween, because it's my understanding that Halloween is not celebrated in every part of the world, don't let that stop you because you don't need an excuse to put on a costume. No, you do not. I'm wearing a costume right now. What is it? Well, that's a mystery. Maybe by the end of this episode, you'll be able to guess what it is because we'll probably make more than one reference to it as we already have. So... I can't imagine anybody would guess what you're wearing <laughs> unless we tell them exactly what it is. You know what? We'll tell them on the next episode, Jeff. I would love to sure. hear with the listeners. So listeners, by the end of this episode, guess what you think I'm wearing as my costume. And I'll tell you what I thought it would be if I didn't already know what it was. Yes, Jeff will come up with a theory as to what he would think if he didn't see this lovely piece of artwork that I have created. <laughs> you do create lovely artwork. I, I, you know, I try, Jeff. I try, and, like, this is one of my masterpieces right here, so... People can see some of your lovely artwork in our Etsy shop. Yes, and I started making little cards that have uh, Grishaverse-inspired pictures on them, too, which may or may not go up in the Etsy shop at some point, so I'm just working on that as well so working on the art 
Minecraft. And after we get done recording this here episode, we're going to be recording something else that's kind of fun. Yeah. We talked about it, didn't we? In yeah. our last episode? Yeah, we mentioned it in the last episode. So we were privy to seeing an interview with Lee Bardugo uh, with the, oh gosh, what was the name of the organization that put it on? Penn Faulkner. Thank you. I was going to call it the Pew Institute, but that's a different thing. The Penn Faulkner Institute put on a interview with Lee Bardugo about turning her books into a TV show and the process with that and all of her thoughts around that. And it was fabulous. And Jeff and I will be recording a bonus episode all about that and our thoughts about it. And it will be coming out right on this feed right here. So you don't need to go and find it anywhere else. It will just show up here on the feed once it's out. So just stay tuned for that. And in our last bit of news, we did see what Netflix is releasing for the month of October, because each month they put out a list of the things that will be out in the upcoming months, and Shadow and Bone Season 2 is not on that list. So that means at the earliest, we will be getting the Season 2 of Shadow and Bone next November, potentially. That's really the earliest that we could get it now, because it's not on their list of October releases, so... We'll just of be course waiting. it's not on their list of October releases. They haven't even announced casting for certain characters yet. Yeah. Well, I mean... I know they're probably going to hold on to those until it gets closer to the actual release yeah. date because most likely we're not actually going to find out who's playing what unless those characters turn up in the trailer. Yeah. And then everybody is going to instantly be going to IMDb, Google, what have you, and they're going to be trying to figure out who these people are. Or possibly they could do what they did with the cast for the first season of Shadow and Bone, mm -hmm. where your first glimpse at what's going on is you get all the cast members together to introduce themselves and say, hi, my name is this, yeah. and I'm playing this character, and everybody online is either going to be like, oh my gosh, they look exactly like I always hoped they would, or they're going to be like, really? That's what they're going with? Yeah. It's just I feel like... I, I may be other people may have had a different experience but most of what I saw in terms of reaction to the cast for the first season of Shadow and Bone I feel like it was one extreme or the other there was like <laughs> no in between I have a really strong feeling Jeff that the two major characters that we are looking for in the second season are going to have very polarizing reactions from the oh fans. I don't doubt that because one of them is the character that most people have been most excited about even since bef we knew we weren't going to get him in the first season of shadow and bone i'm trying not to uh i'm trying to keep spoilers out of it here yeah but i think the character we're speaking of was more highly anticipated even though people knew going into the first season of shadow and bone that we weren't going to see him yeah and he's extremely on my end anticipated and definitely with a lot of other people too he is definitely very anticipated and the other character which will go unnamed jeff who i'm sure you know who i'm talking about definitely will have a polarizing reaction as well so i definitely think that people are going to have feelings about these nothing things. more than feelings that's beautiful what song is that I, I know that song but what is it the song is called feelings dude well, what is it from though what do you mean what is it from it's just it's a song oh i thought the it was the song from is a called musical. feelings it's like if i started singing lady in red would you ask what lady in red was from it's just a song no but that sounds like a song that's from like a musical you know that's fair it kind of does sound like something that would be from a musical but as far as i know it's just a song and next we have the voice of the people. Voice of the people. That was terrible. Totally out of tune. I don't care. Yeah. Well, out of tune compared to what? What I wanted I mean, in my if, head. If, like if you said the song is going to be in C major and then you did what you just did, which is a B flat, which doesn't appear in the key of C major, then yeah, <laughs> it's probably a little out of tune. But if it's just a one-note song that you made up, which is what you got, then you nailed it. Yeah, well, I will, it wasn't what I was going for in my head. I had something in my head. It didn't translate into my voice, but that's okay. We're here. We have 
the voice of the people. And let me tell you, Jeff, wow. I am just what? floored by our audience because you know what we got this week, Jeff, and I know you heard it already, and it's what a treat, what a dream, what a piece of freaking artwork this is. I am so thrilled beyond belief to announce that we have our very own listener who sent in their Australian Botkin Santa. It is so great, you guys. It's from a listener. Her name is Claire. And when she wrote it, it's so sweet. She said, I hope this is okay and not too stilted. Let me know if you'd like me to record it again. Also, I hope the file type works. This was fun. Let me know if you ever want anything else Aussie. So first, we're going to share with you guys this recording that we got from Claire. This is her interpretation of Santa Botkin Australian style. G'day. Ho, 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 everybody. Australia Santa Botkin here. Make sure you behave yourselves this year and maybe I'll bring you a gracious steel knife of your very own for Chrissy. You'll be bloody stoked. No wackers. Piece of piss, mate. Sweet as. <laughs> <laughs> I love all the Australian slang at the end. That's my favorite part. Yeah, and you know what? Um, one of our listeners on Instagram pointed out that it went a bit too British Cockney at the end. And it's funny, I mentioned South Park earlier uh, mm-hmm. while we were chatting, and I couldn't for the life of me. It just, that whole chippy chip chara thing I did at the end, it just sort of came out and I had no idea where I got that from. And then I looked it up afterwards and I found out it was from an episode of South Park. Uh. I forget the context, but basically they're trying to find a new place for um, one of the characters to live, I think it is. And Uh there's all these different planets and they find out there's actually a whole planet of Australians. And when they get there... Yeah, that's that's how they're greeted by the people from the planet of Australia. <laughs> so I, I didn't know if they actually said that or not. And apparently it just came out of me. And I, I warned everybody, I think, before I did my Australian Bach and Santa that it was going to be bad. Yes, you did warn apparently everyone. it wasn't terrible. It just wasn't super. Yeah. Well, this is super. This is absolutely super. I love the Australian slang. And I will say her name was Claire, correct? Yeah, and Claire gave us a whole list of slang translation. G'day is hello. Chrissy is Christmas. Bloody stoked is really pleased, which apparently is swearing. And, I mean, we bleep out the profanities on our own show, but as far as I know, we only have to bleep out certain things. I don't I don't think that counts as something we have to I censor, would, so I I'm would, not doing I it. I wouldn't say that that's a swear, personally. But that's just my own personal it, it's opinion. It's not something that people would get upset about hearing here. Yeah. Uh, I can tell you that. But no wakas means no worries. Piece of piss means easy. That's my favorite. And then sweet as means excellent. Yeah. I love it. I think if if she wants to write in and give us more slang as we go along or just send us little audiograms, I would be more than happy. And I know you would too, Jeff, to get these. So, Claire, keep up the good work. We love Australian Botkin Santa. And if you yes, have any, Claire, uh, you are our Australian Botkin Santa now, so thank you. It is canon when San- when Christmas actually comes around, Claire. You know you have a job to do at this point. So get ready. We'll we'll send you a manuscript, and we'll take it from there. No wakas. No wakas. 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 So. In other news from Voice of the People, we asked our listeners, if you could go to the Winter Fate, what would your favorite part be? And our friend Paula said, all the parts. Literally every part. Everything. Even the, wait, the apparat wasn't there. He might have been lurking in the corner, but that's just kind of his MO. That's just what he does on the reg. So I don't think he was really doing that because of the Winter Fate. He just likes to become part of the wall and be creepy and spy on people just as a baseline. Fair enough. And then our next answer comes from Bookworm Alley 93 She said, drinks and food. Honestly, same. The signature drink would be something with kvass, of course, with exotic fruits, and you can choose the color to match your kefta. Ooh. Oh, that's clever. Fancy. Now, which Grisha would... Which order would be in charge of changing the color of things? Probably the fabricators. Yeah, that would be a material guy thing. Yeah, they would have to. They'd be able to change the composition of the 
of the um, particles within the drink to reorganize them to turn different That's colors. That's something that the queen could use the fabricators for. She could use them as bartenders. <sighs> oh, yeah. Because, I mean, not that we don't get enough crap being material guys. Let's just make us bartenders. I mean, come on. Hey, bartenders are the nervous system of any good party. Yeah, but also... You have crappy bartenders who make sting- who are like stingy with the spirits or who don't know proper mixology techniques, your party's going to suck, okay? I think Especially I Especially a rich, a fancy decent. people party, because you know these people, they didn't come to necessarily, like, cut up and have a good time, but they at least came to have a good drink. That's true. And I feel like I actually could make a pretty good bartender. I used to work at Starbucks, and I could, wor- I could work the coffee bar. I think I could also... I can shake a good... A good mixed iced tea. I think I could do a martini as well. You mean a martini? Martini, yes. No, <laughs> tea, he, he. Tea, he, 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 he. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so we have one more answer from Yael107030. And they said, the light show, which... Yeah, that would have been pretty cool to watch. Kind of like the fireworks. I'm sure the light show would be fun to go to. Be like a less stressful fireworks show. Yeah. And then finally, in our previous episode, we were wondering, we talked about some of the rumors about why Alina was suddenly able to start using her powers. Mm. And apparently one of the rumors that was floating around is that the Darkling used an elixir of diamonds, I think is how they put it. Yeah. And we were wondering, how do you even go about doing something like that? Well, our dearest, darlingest Mel Not Mal sent us an email with a possible explanation of how that works. So according to Mel's email, there's a thing called gem water. And I do know from some other people that there is a theory that crystals have healing powers. Mm -hmm. And apparently they are now applying this to drinking water. You don't actually put the gems themselves in in the water thank Mm -hmm. goodness because even whether you believe in the healing power of crystals or not science is still a real thing and there are some things in crystals that could be toxic if you consume them so don't put them right in your water like they're ice cubes you put them in a little chamber i guess and then the chamber is covered by a little plastic dome from in most of the versions that i could see Mm -hmm. so it's still close to the water it's in the same container but it doesn't make direct contact with the water you're drinking But in this way, you can kind of absorb some of the healing power of the crystals. And according to Mel, there's a possible explanation for why diamonds might be used specifically for this. Apparently, diamonds can be great amplifiers for emotions, positive or negative, and even conductors of ethereal energy. They can absorb thoughts and radiate them outward for greater effect. When negative energies are dominating the space, these may be amplified by the crystal. Thinking here that the Darkling might be having more power over Alina, control her, and form her in such a way that suits his plan best. You can also use diamonds to detoxify your body, referring to the curse of the Fyrdans. They banish bad auras and give you strength, with that meaning that Alina could also use them to her own strength and banish the Darkling, but I'm sure he would believe it to be impossible due to thinking she is too weak and he is so much more powerful. Then she says, there you go. Love the new game, by the way. It's fun to see yours and our own knowledge tested. Vegan schnippets are the best schnippets. Love, Mel, not Mal. Schnippets. Schnippets. So schnippets. I would really love to know the mechanics of absorbing diamond energy into water, like science, scientifically, specifically, because putting diamonds in a container next to water... Like, I mean, technically See there, speaking, I, I don't think science is going to explain that, though. This is, this is one of those things where it's not a matter of logic or things that you can prove beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a question of, I feel like the app rat needs to chime in here. Yeah. It is not a question of science. You must believe that the diamonds have the power to cleanse you. It's a question of faith, right? Because you have to have faith on the diamond water <laughs> won't do you any good. Thank you, Apparat. There, you get two Apparats for the price of one. I still can't decide which one I like better. 
I like them both. So I appreciate that we get to have both of them in equal capacity. I always hope that people who understand things like healing crystals better than me will get in touch with us and let us know things like that because it's not something that I am very knowledgeable about. So I always like hearing from people who are. Okay, it is time for us to get into the chapters. I'm going to start by summarizing chapter 15, the one that comes after chapter 14, just in case you weren't following. Oh, I didn't know that. Thank you for filling me in. Yeah, numbers go in order. I don't know a lot about numbers, but I'm pretty sure that's how numbers work. Okay, I wrote that on a piece of paper so I remember for next time. Excellent. So here's what happens in chapter 15. Alina is heartbroken over her fight with Mao. In case you forgot, at the end of chapter 14, they reunite and it doesn't go well. While she's crying about it in her room, Bagra shows up and insists that she needs to leave the palace now. She warns Alina that the Darkling's real plan all along has not been to destroy the Shadowfold, but to expand it, and that Alina is supposed to be used as some kind of protective shield against the Volcra once they have Moritzova's stag as her amplifier. Bagra also reveals that the Darkling is the Black Heretic. The one who created the Shadowfold in the first place, just in case you forgot. Oh, also, she's a Shadow Summoner like him. Probably doesn't mean anything. Alina tries to insist that none of this is true, and the Darkling wouldn't do that. But, in the end, she accepts, once again, someone she cared for has let her down. And now, she has to put on a costume and escape from the Little Palace. Thank you, Jeff. That was absolutely lovely. My favorite part is the part where she can't escape until she puts on a costume. I feel like the putting on of a costume makes you feel like you are about to do something very important. Yes, that is very important in her character development, her character shift, her emotions, her feelings, and her drive to leave the little palace as Alina Starkov. It's like going to a convention. You can't walk out of your hotel room until you have put on the garment and assumed the identity of the character. Yes. You you wipe clean your own identity and you become whoever that person, thing, or character is that you have chosen to become for that point in time. So... Actually, the truth is when you cosplay somebody at a convention, there are a lot of people out there who will walk up to you and expect you to be able to just become that character. They expect you to know everything about the show or the movie or whatever that the character came from. They'll expect you to be able to talk like them. And if you if they can trip you up in even the smallest way, those people, I mean, it's just it's a form of gatekeeping and gatekeeping drives me absolutely crazy. Just let people put on a costume that they like to wear. Yeah, I haven't been to a single convention, but I would like to go to one, and I definitely will be cosplaying when I go to one. Uh, I I have no idea what it would be, though. Probably, I want to be Captain Carter. I think that would be fun. So you wanted to know something from me in regards to this chapter. Oh, did I? What did I? It's the first note. Oh. Oh, yes. Yeah, so... I I actually did kind of feel a little bit bad for Alina in this beginning part because she definitely misses Mal. And we did get that last goodbye, Jeff, that you mentioned in one of our previous episodes, but it wasn't adult at this point. As far as this chapter goes, we don't know if we're going to see Mal again. Actually, what I said was I think that Alina is never going to be able to move on from Mal until she gets closure. And if this Mm -hmm. is the last conversation that they ever have, she still didn't get it. To get closure, they have to be able to be honest with each other about what they've been feeling and either reconcile or accept that they have reached a parting of the ways. And neither of those things really happened because I feel like a lot of the things that she said to Mal were very defensive. They were designed to hurt his pride. And a lot of it was just the stuff that the darkling would want her to say so it's almost like she wasn't talking he was doing it for her Mm -hmm. and he wasn't even there that's yeah that's actually a really good point and that's something that she'll reflect on later in the coming chapter i think it's actually chapter 16 where we're going to get to that point but 
you're right. She was talking the words that the Darkling had spoken to her and that she has definitely internal at this point has internalized to be quote unquote her own thoughts. But we'll realize later that and and as we've already noted, Jeff, as the readers, that these aren't really Alina's thoughts and feelings. She's just kind of following the Darkling's lead and he is evil and a manipulator and she just can't understand like how 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 could he be this way how could the darkling be a bad person how could this man who has the word dark in his name be doing all these dark terrible things yeah duh yeah i mean come on alina i you're a smart girl she is a smart girl and see this to me is like a line in the sand that we might possibly draw between mm-hmm. the Darkling and Mal, because yes, Mal was very unaware of her feelings. Yes. He did a lot of things to her and in front of her that hurt her deeply, and they mm-hmm. never had a conversation about it. And never. yet, it's pretty clear that he genuinely still loves her otherwise he wouldn't be taking all of this so hard they wouldn't even have had the fight they had in the last chapter whereas the darkling has taken the trouble to engage in obviously manipulative behaviors because he's using her as a means to an end and as proof alina in this chapter is trying to rationalize everything that the darkling has said to her and done with her so far Mm -hmm. she is refusing to accept that he could possibly be a bad guy even though bagra who has no reason to lie is making a very very good case for why he's a villain she never did that with mal yeah so because mal never tried to manipulate her into doing anything he just wasn't as aware of what he was doing to her as he should have been, which is still not good. But no. he didn't have nefarious purposes he was trying to turn her to. So hold, so jump jump on this weird metaphor train with me that I have in my head for a second, Jeff, because I have a weird metaphor that's flowing in my head and I would like to share it. Um, All right. So in my head, Alina is a piano. Alina is a piano. Mal and the Darkling both want to play songs on the piano. They want to play beautiful songs. Mal wants to play the song, but does not know how to use, like, play the piano. And he's trying very poorly to play a positive and beautiful song. Whereas the Darkling knows exactly how to play the piano, but he's playing a dark, evil song on the piano and hitting every single perfect little key that he can to get to that point and hitting every single little button in Alina that sets off exactly how he wants her to react. Whereas Mal is just like clunking along the keys and being like, brown, 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 and hoping that he does the right thing at some point. Does that make sense? It does make sense. Ha, okay, I'm not crazy. Though. Not a bad metaphor. Yeah, I feel because I feel like Mal Mal has good intentions. He he is not fully fleshed out as an adult yet because he is a child and he has feelings, he can see them, they're somewhere. He's headed in that general direction. When he loses Alina, he can kind of see it a little bit more clearly, but he's still kind of blindly clunking on the keys whereas the darkling is like well i've been playing piano for 125 years let me just step on up and hit the exact keys that i know that will play the alina will follow me to the end of the earth song so what you're getting at is he has mal has good intentions bad ideas whereas the darkling has bad intentions and And good good ideas. ideas not because his ideas are just, but because his ideas will work and yes. he's doing them on purpose. Exactly. Very well said, Jeff. Might be careful about a metaphor that literally turns Alina into an object that has no function unless other people are using her, but otherwise the metaphor was very good. Well, I mean, that's exactly how the Darkling looks at her, is an object to be used to meet his needs. Oh, okay. No, that makes a little bit more sense. Then the, you're not saying she is a piano. You're saying that they're looking at her as a piano, like she is. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, then that metaphor is perfect. Yes, the Darkling definitely sees her as an instrument to be used to meet a certain mean, a meet a certain end. Ah, and, and we definitely an see instrument. Th- yeah, she is an instrument like of his doings and his intentions and how he wants to 
bring things into the world and how he wants to save Ravka. And we see this exactly from how Bagra, from what Bagra is telling Alina too, and saying that he's using her. Essentially, that's pretty much what Bagra is saying. Bagra's like, "You silly girl, can't you see that he is using you?" And she's like, "No, no, 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 no. He's he's a nice man. He was gonna come bang me in my room later tonight. He's a nice man." <laughs> he's gonna come bang me in my room. <laughs> I mean, that's what was going to happen. I mean, in in in, fin, in fanfic terms, Jeff, they were already smashing faces. So, you know. <laughs> is smashing faces a real term? I mean, I've seen it used in fanfiction. It is my favorite depiction of kissing is smashing Wasn't faces there like together. a war? There was like a battle oh, royale a battle of, the, of tongues the tongues or something from that fanfiction yes, that we read? the battle of the tongues. Well. First you have to smash faces, and then you have a battle of the tongues after you smash faces. Got it. <laughs> oh, fan fiction. You you just contribute so much to the world. We cannot thank you enough for the amount of wonderful contributions people who have written fan fictions have given us, Jeff. What a, Agreed. What a treat. What a joy. But we Somehow the saddest part of this chapter is actually when we find out exactly where the Volcra came from. I think that is absolutely devastating and just so sad and just, yeah, sad, I guess. I mean, they are alive. They're still alive, but they're not, I mean, they were just ordinary people. And then they were too close to the shadow fold when the whole thing went off and they were transformed into monsters. Yeah, they must be hanging out somewhere between life and death inside these animals because you're right, they are living, breathing creatures, but they clearly don't have the same level of consciousness and choice for themselves as they did in their humanoid form. And it's just devastating that these people got their lives stolen from them by the Darkling and now kind of have to do his bidding and seem to be chronically tortured until they die which is absolutely horrific because you have to think some of these are kids and some of the like some of these were like five-year-old children that were just in the vicinity of the fold when it was formed and now are robbed of their entire life and they have nests in the shadow fold which to me suggests that they've been not only turned into monsters but in terms of their capacity, they've been reverted to some kind of pr- more primitive creature, and now they are breeding, and yeah. they they have no choice but to accept that this is life now because they aren't aware of anything else. Yeah, I would love to know what level of consciousness they retained from their human form, like if they have certain character traits from how they were as a human or they can remember certain things here and there about being a human. I'm sure that when they interact with the humans, when they come into the fold, that triggers them a little bit and probably is why they get even more mad when they see these people because they can see in front of them the lives that were potentially could have been lived by them are sitting right in front of them. And, That's a possibility. Yeah, it's just so sad. I I understand why Lee made this choice in the book, and it makes sense, but it definitely is really devastating to think about. I don't want to encourage this kind of thing, but I'm a little bit surprised that they don't have a Volcra in captivity so that they can study them. Because surely somebody in this Grishaverse must be wondering the exact same thing that you just described. And a yeah. lot of times the only way to find out things like that is to keep a specimen in captivity so that you can examine it. Yeah. Just knowing what we're going to get coming into some of the other books, I can't see how they wouldn't have done that. Because the Volker can't be any more dangerous than some of the other things we're going to meet along the way. And... They keep those things in captivity, so I can't, and they study them, so I can't see how they wouldn't, maybe even not the Robkins, but someone else, like, say, like, the Fjordans, possibly, would keep one of these in captivity and and study it, you know? 
be kind of dangerous, wouldn't it, to know that the Fjordans can actually infiltrate the fold long enough to survive mm. and capture a Volcra specimen, get out of the fold, and then safely transport it back to Fjorda? I wonder. So here's a question I have for you, Jeff, and maybe even the listeners. So we know that the Volcra live within the context of the fold. I'm wondering that if they exit the fold, do they like disintegrate? or something and become non-existent because we never see them outside of the context of the fold as far as i know well we find out in this chapter that the darkling wants to use alina's power as a kind of light shield to protect him from the volcra because he wants to expand the shadow fold outward and use that as a weapon to threaten ravka's enemies into submission so Mm -hmm. there's something i mean they live in a place that is pure darkness and light being the absence or darkness being the absence of light i think it's the light more than anything that they can't stand because even if it doesn't hurt them it's most likely it would just take away their ability to see i i I mean i'm just wondering like if you take a volker out of the fold does it just not does it like shrivel up does it not exist i don't think so does it... I think it just wouldn't be able to withstand the light yeah. of the sun. It wouldn't be able to see. See, in my head, their bodies would also do something, too. Like, their bodies would react very badly to the sun. Like, even if you covered the Volcra's eyes, in my head, I'm like, but their bodies aren't used to the sunlight. So you have to think if you bring, like, it's like the fish that live at the bottom of the sea who are, like, translucent. And if you bring them up to the surface, their insides get fried because their skin is translucent because they live like literally in the complete darkness at the bottom of the sea and you bring them up and they have the sunlight on them and it's just like if you and i went outside and held our organs out to the sun and (laughs) for multiple hours at a time it probably wouldn't end well probably not so I imagine that that's kind of like that. I would actually wonder, and I'm surprised, maybe underneath the feathers that the Volker have, because I'm pretty sure they have feathers from the description that we get of them, um, if their skin is like actually translucent, because that would make sense because it doesn't get any sunlight. So the function of having pigments in your skin is kind of negated because the function of pigments in your skin is to protect uh, your skin and your other organs from being like fried and having damage from um, like rays of sun and things like that. One of the functions of the pigments in your skin. But I would wonder if the Volcra have translucent skin. What do you think, Jeff? I don't know. Hmm. Juliana is probably. I getting, think we're I, bound to find out. I think I'm. I'm getting a little bit too more too scientific about this. The other thing about the chapter that really stood out for me, and this should have been the biggest tell for Alina that she's definitely telling her the truth about the Darkling, is that Bagra is actually seeming to show genuine pity and concern. At least as much of that as you ever get from someone like Bagra. Yeah, and Alina even notes that getting pity from Bagra is a rare occurrence, and she she sees it, and yet she doesn't want to believe him i mean believe her and she she just doesn't want she doesn't want to believe that the darkling is evil i mean his name is the darkling bagra has shown you that she also is a shadow summoner thank you a shadow summoner all of the things she's saying pretty much check out i mean my girl alina come on But that's the power of obsessive love, though. She wouldn't let go of Mal this whole time because she loved him for years and years and years. And then she finally lets herself accept that there may be somebody else in her life who genuinely cares about her. And he has set her up in a very unique position. He taught her to use or he helped make sure she learned how to use her power. He made her feel special. He paid attention to I mean, he groomed her. He is what he did. The whole her. thing was disturbing grooming behaviors. Oh, yeah. And it worked because now she is going to need some serious deprogramming before she's willing to let go of this cult leader that yeah. she has been following around this whole time. Yeah. 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 
Um, and I mean, hot take for me, Jeff. I think that Alina, during this time when she was with the Darkling, should have used her time that she was thinking about Mal and pining over him to pay more attention to what the Darkling was doing with her because a lot of the time she was just kind of accepting what the darkling was saying thinking about the darkling and then being like where's mal i miss him yeah because that's how being deeply in love with somebody that is suddenly taken away from you works okay okay so moving on chapter 16 alina has to escape from the darkling now and the escape plan is simple alina leaves with the performers after the fate and travels to Oskrovo, 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 crosses the shadow fold and then secures a passage on a Kirch trading ship to Verleron. But why is Bogger even bothering to help Alina? Well, it turns out that Bogger is responsible for making the Darkling the ambitious man that he is now, and she wants to give him a chance at redemption. Alina stows away in a wagon, falls asleep, and doesn't wake up until the wagon stops at an inn at approximately noon. She holds up in a barn for the night and then spends the evening debating whether to continue her escape or return to the little palace to her boyfriend, the Darkling. She is still attracted to the Darkling, but she realizes he's been manipulating her with potential romance so he can use her special power. Hours, and then it's time for a traveling montage. Alina sees many things along the way, and along the way she sees people praying to her that she is okay, which is very meta. And then she gets hit by a drunk man on the way out of town. She manages to get away, but she has to cast some sunlight out of herself, and by doing that she alerts a nearby Oprishnik of her presence. Alina is able to evade them, but she loses all of her supplies. But at least she has her weapons, including her Grisha steel knife. Then, conveniently, Mal finds Alina immediately after her run-in with the soldiers. Convenient much? And Mal reveals that Morozova's herd is nearby, and he's the only one who can track them because of the, his special tracking powers. Alina explains that she's escaped from the Darkling in order to save the world, and not because of some lover's spat. And then they go to sleep. That's it. Thank I you. love how you just whip through that whole thing and you're like, and then they go to sleep. <laughs> the, the end. I mean, after that, you definitely need a nap, at least, at a minimum. That's a long day. A long day of stuff. Yeah, I mean, she discovers people literally praying not just about her, but praying to her, I think, don't they? Yeah, that's why. Well, she's. they don't know she's there, but she, they are praying for her safety and for her to save them. And it's just very meta and wild. Just imagine walking into a church, not knowing what the people in the church were doing, and have them being all like, Hail Saint Jeff! Jeff yeah, the Saint of Fabulousness! Yes, Hail Saint Jeff! We pray for his safety! And you're like, I wish I could be safe. Someone save me, someone save me. But you can't tell these people. That you need is saving. this what it feels like to be venerated? Is that what's happening? Oh, da, 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 da. I, I, I'm trying to think of how like people chant in the church. It's very just like Jeff. The Depends saint on of your the, church. Jeff, the saint of fabulousness. Oh, he brings to us many things like glitter and fabulous hair, Jeff. And then the whole church and goes. And with your spirit. Yeah, there you go. Yep, exactly. <laughs> spot on, Jeff. Spot on. I worked for a Catholic church. No big deal. Yeah. I went to way too much Catholic church as a child. Like, way too much. There are days of... There are saints days, Jeff, that are in the middle of the week. I've been to them. Oh, you're telling me. It's wild. It's a wild time. Oh, you're telling me. It's a wild time. But your first observation is very interesting about this chapter. Yeah. I was wondering how Mal hasn't been noticed by anyone higher up in the army before because clearly he has a gift and he has a talent for tracking, but he still seems to just be an average tracker within their whole tracking section of the army. And no one has been like, hey, this kid's really good. We should actually use his special abilities to further our unit and make things better instead of just keeping him as your average soldier. Well, that's kind of two different things, I think. Because 
if he's just the soldier on the ground like he is now, you get him to do the work, which he's better at than anybody else. But if you promote him, he'll keep rising through the ranks to the point where he's the one giving orders True. and other people who aren't as good at doing the work as him are the ones carrying it out. That's why some people who prove to be too good at certain positions at their jobs never get promoted because once they're the ones sitting behind a desk giving orders, they're not the ones making sure that the work actually gets done. So there's no way Mal doesn't get noticed because even the Darkling has heard how good he is. Yeah. But they want him to stay in his current position so that he can actually get the job done instead of just taking all the credit. Yeah. I still think that someone would pull him aside and at least try and train him or maybe even have them teach have him teach them how to be a better tracker or something like that try and extract his knowledge from him well he says himself in this chapter that that's not something that you can learn and it's not something that you can teach it's something that he just knows how to do hmm. it's a feeling you can't teach that i got a feeling that tonight's gonna be a good night. I'm not gonna for these two, it's not. Tonight. It's gonna be a rough night because they're running from the cops and sleeping in the forest. Thank you, Jeff. That was lovely. Might have taken the liberty with the lyrics there, yeah. but that's basically what's going on here. Yeah, they're just kind of, they're just kind of hanging out in the forest. They're walking. They're walking. They're walking for like a very. Very long time. I so okay. So I have another question, Jeff. And this is a what? this is a question that I really would like answered. Uh, just going back to kind of the beginning of the chapter. So Alina is by herself at this point. After the point where Bagra admits that she made mistakes as a mother and then puts her onto a cart in a fun costume, yeah. Yeah, I, and I would just like to say that Bagra is a fashion icon giving Alina all this leather, just really making her work that outfit. Thank you, Bagra, for being a top-notch designer and icon. Bagra, congratulations. You are the winner of Project Runway. She is the winner of Project Runway, and Alina is her is the model that she won with. So congratulations to that team. I also... So my question is, Alina gets into this cart that's like a horse and buggy cart and she's sitting uh -huh. in the back of a horse and buggy cart and then we see her get to the village and she is like okay the fastest way i can get somewhere is by riding a horse i don't understand how they have like magic ish powers and all this other fancy technology but the fastest way they can get somewhere is on a horse how does that compute? How does the math add up there? How do they not have like any form of car or automobile or anything like that? Well, for one thing, we've talked about already how inconsistent the technology is because basically if it involves electricity, then it's probably not been invented yet because they don't really seem to have harnessed that particular energy source yet. I don't know if they're even working on it, but... As far as how she is choosing to get away, I think the point is not how quickly they can get her away, but how likely it is that she will be detected. They put her in an outfit and in the back of a cart because it's inconspicuous. But they, that doesn't change the fact that they don't have cars. Well, I just said, they don't have, I mean... How about, like, floating, floating like, hoverboards or... Or, like, things that rely on, t like, air or water. How about a waterway? Well, up to this point, the level of technology we've seen isn't that sophisticated, so they probably don't have those things. And even if they do, they probably aren't that easy to come by without having to pay a very large amount of money to somebody who's likely to turn on them because they have to take that into account too. They also have to take into account how can they get her out of here without putting her in the hands of somebody who is just going to make a U-turn and bring her right back to the Darkling. Or somebody more dangerous than the Darkling, like, hey, the Darkling is going to want this girl from you, so if you give me a whole bunch of money, I'll turn her over. 
I still refuse to believe that horseback is the fastest way that they could get someone there. There must be another. There must be another means of transportation. There has to be. It meets all the criteria that they need. I think it's the fastest way that is inconspicuous and doesn't put Alina in more harm than she's already in right now. Any other means of transportation for her that might be available that are a little bit faster is something that they just can't rely on. Yeah, I guess I'll just leave it there because I know what technology we're going to get going forward into the other books. So I think that's why I'm kind of stuck on it in my head. I'm like, how can they not freaking have cars if they have all these other things that are coming? I know the technology you're talking about, and I don't think those things were readily accessible because the other thing that I think you have to take into account is this is kind of done on the fly. Yeah, that's true. They had to do this quickly and arranging anything else like that would be much more conspicuous much more expensive and would require much more careful planning but this could have been a snap decision that bagra made like okay i see the opportunity and i haven't warned alina that we're going to try to get her out of the castle Mm -hmm. so if we're going to do this we have to do this now and we have to do this in a way that is not going to be difficult to arrange logistically speaking yeah i guess that's true Okay, I will accept this for now, Jeff. Uh, I'm not happy about it, but I will accept it, and that's fine. So she gets away. She makes it to this town where people are worshipping her as a saint while she's still alive, which, again, has never happened before, so there's no way to know how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. And then she walks smack dab into a group of soldiers, and the next thing you know, oh, this... Do we have we have to talk about this? Mm-hmm. Do we have to? What about her meeting the guy, the drunk guy, and yeah. how he's gonna like rape her and she saves herself? Yeah, we at least need to we at least need to acknowledge that there are far too many men who are terrible. Yeah, in these books, there are a lot of terrible people. Yeah. Most of them are men, and yeah. most of the men are terrible to women. The ones who are yes. terrible. Yes. But fortunately, this guy who obviously thinks it's okay to treat women this way has absolutely no idea who he's messing with. And Mm -hmm. Alina gets him back. That I do like. I do like that. It sucks that the Oprichnik sees her, that this guy who's an Oprichnik just happens to be at this bar. I mean, honestly, what are the odds? Especially- He probably has them all over the place because they probably do a lot more than we realize. They may have been gathering intelligence on other people and then he sent them a message and said, hey, hey, by the way, um, the Sum Summoner uh, got out. So if you guys could just like keep an eye out for her and bring her back to me if she shows up, okay, thanks. Yeah. That's how he signs his notes. K thanks. K thanks. I was calling him in some of the other ones. I was calling him Big D. K thanks. Big D. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Uh, it feels weird calling him Big D. I feel like that's what name he would call himself though. If he was uh, if D. he was in like the modern era, he would definitely call himself Big D. I don't think anybody really needs to call themselves that. No, they don't. But the Darkling does a lot of unnecessary things. Well, it's they're not unnecessary. They're extravagant. They're opulent. The Darkling oh, yes. is a drag queen, opulence. right? Yes. Yeah, so he can he can call himself Big D. I have no problem with with the drag queen calling themselves that. Oh my gosh! Now there's going to be a drag queen out there called Big D. If that <laughs> ever happens, I'm calling you immediately. I don't care if it's like two in the morning. We will go. And I'm at a bar and you're probably asleep. I'm going to call you and let you know there's a drag queen named Big D. And I'm going to see if I can get them to talk to you I was going to say, you better put them on the phone if you meet this person because I would love to speak with them. Oh, that's definitely going to happen. Okay, good. The The universe has willed it, so it's, uh, it shall be so. Uh, but So this chapter's got a lot of highs and lows. So yeah. unfortunately, she has to leave the castle, but oh, Bagra's helping her, and everything's going fine at first, and then she meets terrible men who are terrible. Oh, but she gets the better of them, and she gets away. But then she loses everything she had brought with her to survive, and that ain't much. Yeah, she loses pretty much everything except for her Risha's seal knife, 
which shout out to Botkin. Santa Australian Botkin, uh, God bless you. What a what a or treat. Saints bless you, Santa Australian Botkin. Sa- Santa sa- or, Santa Santa Botkin. Be, oh, okay, no, we need to we need to standardize this. Is it Santa Australian Botkin or Australian Santa Botkin or Australian Botkin Santa? I think it would be Australian Botkin Santa. That makes the most sense. Yeah. Nationality and then name and then title. Title. And um, it's alphabetical that way. Yeah. So Australian Botkin Santa, thank you for your contribution. We we or abs. <laughs> yeah, abs. I like abs. Him. Australian Botkin Santa. He's got abs. I hope so. He's oh, surfing yeah. all day long, so you know, gotta have good abs if you're surfing. Mm-hmm. Good core strength. Okay, yeah, so Alina's having a pretty bad day, but I, I do like the point where she comes to when she's in the forest, kind of defending herself, where she finally realizes how strong she is and how much she's learned working with people at the Little Palace, like Bagra mm-hmm. and Botkin, and she is actually a weapon by herself, and she is strong, and she can defend herself. Which is something she's never really thought about herself before or really believed that she could do before. So it's definitely really nice to see her coming into her own in a way and realizing that she is a strong, badass woman just ready to be out here slashing people with these knives right here. I don't need weapons. I am the weapon. This needs like a James Newton Howard score behind it. That seems very appropriate. I like it. I'm here for it. I like it. It's canon. Um, she's running through the forest. Like she's getting ready to do some strength training, do like some tree squats. And then next thing you know, boom, she runs into somebody that I know that you are just thrilled to see. Yeah, I mean, it's nice that he's here and that she's not alone anymore and he can more inconspicuously go into towns and get supplies for them, which is nice because she can't really walk into a town anymore at this point and not be recognized or seen. But we have Mal. Great. How did he find her? Really? Why? After everything we just found out about what the Darkling did to her on purpose, we're still not giving him a break? I mean, for her specifically, this is kind of the best case scenario because this is someone she loves and cares about and he's actually here to save her. But they're still both pretty salty. Mostly Mal is very salty about what happened with the Darkling and can't seem to move forward. And Jeff. This begins something that Juliana will take to the ends of the freaking earth. It is the extreme lack of communication between these two people. Here we go. We're starting it with the ball really rolling here because this is... This is where that starts? This is where I'm going to say it like really like takes off. We saw the seeds. We saw the plane getting formed at the beginning. Yeah, because I kind of thought that this would have started where uh, she was trying to figure out how she could tell him that it hurts her feelings when he sleeps with people that aren't her, and she didn't. Yeah, well, I think I think that was kind of a hint towards it. And then we had some time away from each other. But now we're going to be together for a little bit, and we're not going to talk to each other for days pretty much just we have all these feelings we have all these thoughts in our head we have many 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 opportunities to say these thoughts out loud to speak to the person we are thinking about out loud in privacy because we're out in a freaking mountain there's no one else out here and have a nice conversation with them and just clear the air you know and we don't Sorry, how many opportunities do we have? Many, 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 many. I can't wait to see what your sound waves look like. I know, for audio purposes. <laughs> I moved my like head There's going to be one great big one where you went, many. Yeah, and circle, circled the microphone. Uh-huh. Yeah, just like that. But they just don't want to talk about their feelings and we can tell from what alina says in her head to us and kind of the body language we're reading off of mal that 
they want to say something to each other, but they just mm-hmm. don't. Well, the only way I can really... When I first read this, I was so frustrated with how long it takes them to really start being honest with each other about things that they should be honest about. Yes. But I realized that describes like best case scenario where yeah. they have this moment very, very quickly about how to communicate honestly and then it never becomes a problem again but even in real life when you have that Mm -hmm. very down-to-earth moment with somebody that you haven't been communicating with it can still come up again and Mm -hmm. without giving anything away we know that in this part of the grisha verse there's three books in this set yeah so there's two more whole books about what's going to go down after this one, and we're just getting into the home stretch of the first one. So yeah. I think that we, we have to be patient with their lack of communication because that's just lead writing characters well. It, it, she's giving it a place to go. She's giving them many, 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 many more opportunities to not speak to each other and just not communicate with each other. Because, you know, Jeff, like you said, we have like two more books for them to just not say things to each other, just not communicate with each other and just... Well, eventually they'll start communicating with each other. It's just, it's going to take something, I mean, they've already been through a great deal, but it's going to take, I think, something even bigger than what they've already been through for them to get to it. I will say, I think that bigger is not the correct word that you want to use, Jeff. I think freaking ginormous is probably the word that you want to use to describe what's going to make them speak to each other. And listeners, when we get to that point, let me know what you think, because there's going to be a lot of bigger opportunities for these two to speak to each other, and they just won't. Thank you for making the distinction between bigger and freaking ginormous. Now I finally understand that scale. <laughs> it's a it's a um, incremental scale, Jeff. So yes, freaking ginormous. Now one thing you do have to admit about Mal is that he's confident for a reason. Yes. I, I personally, even if I didn't like Mal, I would have to appreciate when she's wondering. Alina is about whether or not they'll find Moritzova's stag while he's protecting her, and he's like, oh. They won't find it without me. Yeah. This is where he's describing how being better than everyone else at tracking is something he knows they can't just learn how to do. Like, he's always Mm -hmm. going to be better at it than they are. Yeah. Because even if you don't like Mal, you have to agree. He's a good tracker. This is the thing he's better at than anybody. Yeah. I can agree with you on that one. I, I am not so delusional in my opinions of Mal and Alina that I will not acknowledge that and alina knows that he's good she's always known that he's been good at this no matter what like even when they were kids we have some memories of them and ma will be able to track down small animals and things like that and yeah he's he's very good he's he's one in a lot of numbers of people he's an individual he's special special he's a special boy well isn't he special now were you at all moved by the closing moments of this chapter where alina says hey mal and he says yeah and she says thank you for finding me and he says always always well you know when i was at school i sent that to a boy And it was about my girlfriend from high school. Her name was Lily Potter. Okay, the number of problems that I instantly have with what's going on. (laughs) Wow. Always. (laughs) I can't do a Snape impression. It's so bad. No, actually, the Snape impression was pretty good, as long as we're talking about the Snape from um, the Potter Puppet Pals, which is the one that I always always defect to that one. Like, uh, that's my go-to. No, but seriously, do you have, like, any feelings about this little brief emotional exchange between these two? I think it's kind of cute. It's It definitely made me think, like, aww. And then I, I just, I, just the fact that they just he said always at the end, I was like, Snape. No, that's fair. 
Snape has been very, very closely associated with that word, though. Yeah. Very, very different context, though, because in that yes. case, he's saying, I have always been in love with this girl who was never in love with me, and I always will be, and I don't need to talk to anybody about it because wizards don't have therapy. Whereas in this case, he's saying, I love you and you love me, and we haven't said it out loud yet, but we both know it, and no matter what happens, I will always love you back. I will always come looking for you because our relationship, though dysfunctional, is not creepy. And is mutual. And is mutual. And, and consensual. Consensual. Yeah. That word is so important. But that's where we leave off these two chapters. Alina and Mal are finally reunited without anybody else around. He is her only hope for survival now. He finally has her in a position where somebody is not talking in her other ear, telling her to say things that aren't really her. And maybe, just maybe, in the next chapter, we will find out that they actually start to slowly resolve their issues i mean admittedly they're trying to find more so of a stag and then yeah. they're trying to figure out what the hell do they do with the stag when they do find it because they don't have any fabricators around mm -hmm. them to help turn the antlers into a, an amplifier so i mean they're, they're gonna have to improvise here yep but at least they are together and it's gonna be a long journey so they're gonna have to talk about something do they I don't think they do. I think they can just. Y sit you want inside. they should just travel in silence until they find the stag? That's not going to be very interesting reading. Yeah, I mean, you know, like we already did it for a little bit, so you know, it's fine. So, Juliana. Yes, Jeffrey. My friend. My friend. We have learned a great deal about each other in the past year that we have become friends. Hi. Yes. Hi. Hi. Yes. And Hi. there is one thing. Hi. And there is one thing that I know about you. It is that you love corny jokes. I do. I I love a dumb corny joke. If you can if you can hit me up with a good dumb corny joke, I am down for it. Well, I've got a few for you because today's fun segment is something that I am simply calling Jeff's Got Jokes. Yes. I have written for you a couple of corny jokes based on Shadow and Bone. Oh boy, okay. I went looking for jokes written by other people about Shadow and Bone and didn't find that many, so I just decided to make up my own because I just thought this idea was so fun. I was gonna say, I feel like they probably don't really exist because I know I was looking for a stupid joke the other day about Shadow and Bone or the Grishaverse in general, and there just like aren't that many of them. Well, they will now because I am speaking truth to power. Well, fill the world with what you, you want to see. Are you ready for the jokes? Yes, I am. I am prepared. I am ready to tee hee 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 at these jokes. Okay. Hey, Juliana. Hi, Jeff. Did you know one of the Shadow and Bone characters hired someone to be his family? No. Why did you do yeah, that? Yeah, he calls them his bot kin. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty that's a good one that's a good pun that's that's a good one i like that one that was good hold Jeff. your breath because they just get worse from here okay good honestly the stupid of the joke the more i like it and the more sophie yells at me because <laughs> okay good because that's what's covered up okay great why doesn't the darkling like to do his laundry i don't know why because he has to shadow fold his shirts. Oh. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Yes, that was a good one, Jeff. I like that. This next one's a little bit of a stretch, but I okay. think I made it work. Okay. Lay it on me. Do you know the real reason Corporal Guy can't stand Ethereal Guy? Because they're inferniating. Oh. That, that's a good one. I, not quite as like funny, funny, but a very good, very good play on words, Jeff. I struggled to just. I was thinking about all the different. I may come up with one later. I wanted to do one where one of the Grisha orders was like worked into a pun. Yeah. Actually, the next one kind of does do that. I, I'm not sure if the next one is better or not. Okay. Well, let's hear it anyway. I'm down for it. 
Well, speaking of laundry and ethereal guy, did you know that they invented laundry detergent? No. Yeah, that's why they're called Tide Makers. Oh! <laughs> so that's a good one. I feel like I feel like that would it would make a really good joke if you like like what's a what's a um ethereal guy's favorite brand of laundry detergent? Tide or something Tide stupid like maker. that. Tide <laughs> maker. We kind of already came up with a good pun with Joanne's fabricators, but that was last episode yeah. and we didn't know that was gonna happen. Yeah, that could definitely be worked in that could definitely like be a joke. Like what is what where do material guy get all their fabrics from? Joanne Fabricators. fabricators. Ah! <laughs> okay, now this this last one I this last one is so stupid. It's not even like a pun and it's not, I just, I couldn't help it. I wrote it down and it made me laugh. Okay. So even if you don't think this is funny, I did this last one for me. Okay. I honestly, the dumber the joke, Jeff, the more I like it. I, I like, I like peak, peak stupidity is what I'm going for. <laughs> okay. Hold on to that thought. Where does the apparat like to go on vacation? Apper out? Uh, I don't know. No. <laughs> Where? Who cares? He's a stupid a- <laughs> <laughs> That was very dumb, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> but also good and valid, I and guess... I liked that. <laughs> That's cute. I don't... I don't know. I don't know why I thought that was so funny. You're like, hee hee hee. <laughs> I mean, even looking at it, I'm like, who cares? He's a stupid. A- I feel like the, I feel like I see a lot of those jokes when I'm looking up dumb jokes online, and I'm just like, I do think to myself, I was like, the person who wrote this definitely thought this is a lot funnier than the people who are reading it. Oh, yeah. I've always loved a dumb joke, Jeff. I've always loved a really, really stupid dumb joke, and I'm here for it. Well, I hope that you enjoyed some of the silly jokes that I wrote because now there are dumb shadow and bone jokes out there. And yeah. if, if I can come up with more later, I'll, I'll come up with more later. I'm going to need to brainstorm some shadow and bone jokes too now, Jeff. You've inspired me with your pieces of art that you've created to go out into the world and create more piece of art. Uh, moving into the question of the week. <laughs> I think we need to do a take two. I, I think it was perfect. I think it's I think it's spot on. I think it's great. Um, I, 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 I ink that the question of the week this this past week was that <clears throat> in chapters 15 and 16, someone is going to try and get Alina to leave the little palace. And who could that be? And the answer to the question was, of course, Bagra, as we already spoke about in our chapter summaries and chapter discussions. And we got correct answers from Yael 107030 and our friend Bookworm Alley, who also said, but she said Bagra, but I can't help imagine if it was someone else, like our beloved Fenyor, trying to save Alina from the Darkling and his dark, twisted plans. Fenyor the Savior. It would be easy for a Heartrender to take care of the guards and hop Alina out of the palace. See, I was kind of hoping, I guess, for more guesses of people trying to come up with, even if they know the answer, trying to come up with reasons why it could be other people. Yeah. Like, well, if you think about it, Zoya probably thinks if she can get Alina to leave the castle, then Alina is no longer a threat to her privilege and her popularity. And if Fedyr's doing it, it's probably because Fedyr has taken a liking to her and genuinely wants her to be okay, and he mm-hmm. overheard something he shouldn't. Or maybe Mal snuck back into the castle and said, okay, look, you and me are going to work our shit out, and we are going to do it on the road because you're in danger here, so come with me if you want to leave. You want to leave. I like the idea of Fenyor taking Alina and helping her out because as we've always already established we like Fenyor. he's a good guy we like him a lot and i could definitely see him having these interactions with alina and also knowing kind of what's going on behind the scenes because he's kind of 
in our head can in my head can at least he's dating ivan and they're together in a long-term care relationship but that being said i don't know fenger's exact sexual orientation or jet or uh, identity he could definitely be bisexual or pansexual or anything along the lines in the queer spectrum so he definitely sure maybe maybe he's looking for a polyamorous relationship between himself ivan and alina and he is out to save him and maybe ivan's actually a good guy too underneath all of the badness and your cat is very loud <laughs> I know my cat is outside the door. She's very, very mad. She's just one of four, but she's the one who pouts the most if I don't let her in. Normally, I would let her come in and sit in my lap, but then the others would get mad that I can't let them in, and I can't do that because they'll run around and they'll tear stuff up and they'll just disrupt the whole. They will not respect what we're what we're trying to do. So so disrespectful. So well, we'll wrap up. They're we'll... not. They don't mean it. They're kitties. Yeah, the kitty cats, but. Those are the answers that we got from our friends. So thank you for our, our friends who wrote in their answers. And for our next question of the week. So our question about the upcoming chapters, chapter 17 and 18, is when Mal returned from getting supplies from Petrozoli, what was he wearing? So if you want to answer that question, you can tweet at us. You can email us or send us a DM. And we would love to hear what your answer is. If you would like to get in contact with us, you can listen to us on all places where pods are cast. And we are also over on YouTube at Into the Fold Podcast. And we are very, very friendly people. We love to engage with our listeners, especially on our social media platforms, where you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Into the Fold Pod. Come and check out our posts, get in on the conversation, because honestly, our favorite part of doing this is getting the input from you guys about what you think and that actually leads to a lot of really great conversations so come check us out yes and if you would like to send us an email you can email us at into the full pod at gmail.com if you have a longer form question common concern that you would like to share with us which is absolutely fabulous and i would like to remind our listeners that if you have a guess as to what my costume is please send us either a dm or hit us up on any of our socials or the email if you have a drawing of what you think i look like right now go ahead go for it i'm also curious to know what people think i look like based off of solely just my voice that is something i've been thinking about a lot recently so if you think you know what my face looks like and you actually haven't seen it go ahead draw it i'd love to see what it looks like <laughs> Yes, draw it. Draw I draw it. Is that the do people in the south send say us draw a drawing? Or they should, or they say drawer. Do, do southern people say drawer? Uh, I I see. I don't feel like it's a thing where it's a part of the country that you come from where you you say draw or draw or what? Draw. Draw. As if I draw. Sometimes because when you say drawer, like draw me a picture, I think I'm gonna go look in my drawer for a pair of socks. Yeah, I feel like when I want to say like drawer, like that's more of like drawing. But when I want to say like I put my shirt in the draw, like that's more what I'm talking. So I was like draw for me is well, like that's not even spelled the same. No, drawing because draw is D R A W. Drawer like you put something in is the same as drawer. Yeah, so I have it backwards, kind of. Oh, well, wouldn't be the first time. And if you listen to us on Apple Podcasts and you want to do something to help us out, we would really appreciate it if you would take a moment to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts so that we can read it on the show. We'd love to get feedback from you guys, and we really love when you guys leave nice things about us. It, it makes us so happy. Yes. And the best way that you can share this podcast with other people, if you are enjoying it, is to tell other people you know to go and listen to the show. And we've had some lovely listeners who have already done that. And so we thank you very much for sharing the show with your friends and with your online communities. And we, we just want to say thank you to anyone who's done that and encourage anyone who hasn't to go and share it with your other fellow Grisha. So that way they can enjoy being part of this as well. And Jeff, until next time, see you in the fold, in the in the shadow laundry shirt folding, in the drawer, or whatever I said.
Okay, sip of coffee first. Yep, go for it. My mug has Dolly Parton words on it. Wow, what is she saying? When I have something to say, I'll say it. Perfect for a podcast recording. I, I mean, honestly, especially since this is a strictly audio format. So say the things you need to be saying, Jeff. And I'm Juliana. And this week we are talking about Shadow and Bone chapters 14 and 15. 50, oh, gosh. Wrong. Sorry. Your picture was covering the, the thing. Uh, okay. Well, hopefully everybody is good and ready. We're reading chapters 15 and 16 of Shadow and Bone today. So if you have not read up to those point... Yeah, those point. English is the only language I speak, and I'm good at it. Because you do the news. I do the news? Yeah, you do the news sound. Do the news sound for I us. I can't do the news sound today. News. News. <sighs> news. And I th- is your phone going off, Jeff? Was that your phone? That was my phone. That was the it. meeting I told you about that I can't go to uh, because we're doing this. Okay, I was like, is that my phone or is that Jeff's phone? I was like, okay, I think it's Jeff's phone. Well, I'll have to go back and watch that, Jeff. I feel like we've gone on, on quite a tangent at this point. So That's a little out of character for us, isn't it? Oh, so out of character. We never do that. Who would ever think that Jeff and Juliana would go off on a tangent? You crazy people, you. But Yeah. Bloop, toast. Bloop, 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 bloop. Let's let's get get swimming. Just keep swimming, swimming, swimming. What do we do? We swim. We swim. 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 Just don't look because I I have to to go get my swim trunks. I love to swim, and when you want to swim, you got to swim. Yeah. 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 Oh, ain't that? Nuttier than a squirrel turd. Ain't that just? Well, butter my butt. Start that again. You (laughs) almost killed me last time. Well, butter my butt and call me a biscuit. I will not. (laughs) I will do no such thing. (laughs) There are boundaries. I hear cats. Yeah, that's Yuki. Yuki, (laughs) shush. And that's we the end that of the episode. Do, 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 do. I'm going to stop now. <laughs> but I gave you such a good ending clip, Jeff.